Osiris. Spotlight On is brought to you by Light, the technology platform reimagining e commerce for live events. You can learn more about Light at light.com forward slash partnerships. That is L Y T E dot com forward slash partnerships. Hello and welcome to the season seven finale of Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media. I'm your host, Lawrence Purrier. Today, the spotlight shines on a discussion I took part in, hosted by an organization called Brigadoon. Brigadoon connects business and thought leaders who believe in the power of conversation and who embrace curiosity for PowerPoint free discussions that foster deep knowledge and enable connection amongst the participants. I spoke with them earlier this fall about creativity and innovation in art and technology. And now, in collaboration with Brigadoon founder Mark Ross, I bring you this edited and condensed version of that discussion here today. Spotlight On will be back in the new year with what is shaping up to be a stacked lineup of guests. I cannot wait for you to see what we have in store. Enjoy the remainder of 2022, and we'll see you in 2023. In the meantime, enjoy my talk with the members of Brigadoon. Lawrence, going to throw out some ideas, and uh, we'll just have a good chat, and we'll just go for 45 minutes and go Great. from there. All right. Well, well, where are well. you today? Are you up in the Northwest? I am. I'm originally from Connecticut, outside of New Haven, and I spent the better part of 20 years from the mid-90s to a few years ago in New York. And now I am in exile just south of Seattle in um, a little town no one's ever heard of called Normandy Park, nestled on the Puget Sound. Never thought of myself as a West Coaster, but life intervenes and here I am. So, yeah. Thank you for having me, Mark. I really appreciate it. I hope I do right by you over the next few minutes. But I would love to maybe to, to zoom out from that a little bit and level set on some of the things I wanted to talk about as it relates to creativity and technology and innovation and my sort of thesis that those things are impossible to disentangle. Creativity is, I think of it as inspired novelty. I'm a recovering alcoholic and a big part of the secret society that I'm in around that involves looking up words. There's a lot of, a lot of meetings I go to where there's a dictionary keeper. And when a word comes up that we might have assumptions around, we ask the the dictionary keeper to read the definition. And it's always surprising. And I can go down that rabbit hole and give you fascinating little anecdotes about that. But creativity is one that I find myself every year or so looking up again because I forget what creativity really is. The general definition is that it's the ability to produce new things or or to generate unusual ideas. And so I think about it as an inspired novelty. The inspiration part's important, um, just as important as the novelty. And then innovation, I had somebody tell me uh, as part of an executive training a long time ago that it's the practical implementation of creativity, so applied creativity. And so I like to think of it as practical novelty, this sort of practical newness, whereas maybe art doesn't have to have any other point other than aesthetic value or self-expression. Innovation is a little bit different because it has a, it has an, a different intention behind it. If, if that's not all too controversial to say that innovation is necessarily creative, then the best innovators are not just creative minds, but artistic minds, artists, people who apply creativity for aesthetic or expressive reasons first. And I feel strongly about that because every once in a while, a, you know, a really artistic, creative person comes along and jumps the track from being an artist and they start to make impacts in other fields than their initial field or even outside the purely artistic realms. And that's where really amazing and interesting things happen in our society, in our culture, in our development. And I think artists, they see versions of the world that the rest of us don't even really get around to imagining. That's where I've always decided I wanted to live, that intersection of creativity, innovation, technology. And a lot of that is because I grew up in that era, right? I'm a child of the 70s. I tell people all the food was processed, all the, all the children were unsupervised, but somehow we made it. And the world was so wide open. 
I, I sort of think of being that first generation that had things like computers in the home or access to computers in school and just how important all that was being somebody learning about music, learning about technology and really deciding I never wanted to have to choose between the two, which kind of brings me to like the last definition. And this one I might read to you because it's a little wordy. The definition is, is of entertainment. And I was trying to find a good definition of entertainment that, that resonated for me. And this one stood out to me for a lot of almost ominous reasons. It's from Wikipedia and it says that entertainment's a form of activity that holds the attention and interests of an audience. I mean, there's so many things that could make up entertainment then. Likely to be one of the activities or events that have developed over thousands of years specifically for the purpose of keeping an audience's attention. I don't know, that's just, I, that, that it actually kept me awake for a while last night thinking about that just because of how valuable our attention is these days and what a commodity it's become and how valuable it is to companies who are monetizing our attention. <laughs> I was thinking if I were smart enough to be a philosopher or like a theorist or a cultural critic, it would, I, I would have all these thoughts about like, is our entire modern world an entertainment? But then I realized like, that's just like stoner dorm room stoner talk. And so I'm going to leave that alone for now because I, I, I don't have the pedigree to dig into that too much. But it's fascinating to me that that's what entertainment is. So creativity, technological innovation, the entertainment industry, they're all in one big bucket for me. And I cannot disentangle any of that at either the macro industry level or even at the artist level. And so with all that sort of rambling preamble, I want to talk about the history of technology and art just a little bit. The first sheet music, that was really the first big distribution innovation from a technology point of view in the entertainment industry. The first sheet music was published in 1473, about 20 years after the printing press. So very early on, artists seized on technology. And what sheet music allowed to happen was that composers could then travel not physically, but they could start to develop renown as composers. Their work could travel. Their work could be performed, interpreted, presented. And so the composer went from being a local phenomenon to a regional or national or ultimately transnational phenomenon. But it took about 350 years for us to get our first superstar, our first celebrity as uh, from the music world because the world moved slower from the 1400s to the 1800s. And that was, that was Franz Liszt. And for people that don't know Liszt's story, he was the first modern superstar. People went to his concerts and fainted and shrieked and screamed. Women passed out. They fought each other to touch him. They wanted artifacts from him and totems. They tore their clothes off in front of him. You could replace Franz Liszt with Elvis, the Beatles, Ziggy Stardust, Justin Bieber. And it's all one and the same, right? It was this passionate, this passionate fandom where people forget that fan is short for fanatic. And it was this fanatical reaction to the art and the artist. But his innovations weren't, were only sort of secondarily technological. He was known for pushing the limits of the piano, not only as a performer and a composer, but in his technique. And pretty much everything you know about the piano now, every, everything, every use of the piano, every trope on the piano were things he developed. All the things that are really still being used today. Wist was the piano innovator. And he died a couple of years after the first wax cylinder recordings were made. There's no known recordings of Liszt. And so he really lives on in two ways. One is his legend and the other is his sheet music. He's distributed through sheet music. That's the only way, it's the only reason we know about him, the oral history of who he was and what he did and the fact that we could go reproduce the sounds that he wrote down. And so that was really the state of the art, sheet music for, for and even for, you know, a good half a century after the first recordings were made, there were these low fidelity wax cylinders, scratchy, you've seen, heard them, you can go on YouTube and listen to them. It wasn't really until the 30s that vinyl records in the form of 78s took off. And while all that was happening, the next big distribution medium that emerged was radio, right? About a hundred years ago, we live with the fallout of radio's impact, how it changed the culture, the technology, you know, music played on the radio sounded better than any of the recordings you could have in your home at the time. The fidelity was better. 
But radio also took all these different forms of music and transported them in a way that music was never transported before. So the examples could be country music from the Grand Old Opry was now heard in the cities. Or jazz from the Cotton Club was now heard in the suburbs. Sounds that people never would have heard before, never would have encountered, because all these places had little radio transmitters on them. Hundreds of venues around the country, performance spaces, had radio transmitters. And then the networks like NBC came around and started rolling up the transmission rights and would rebroadcast those on their network. And now you've got Duke Ellington playing to audiences across the country. Incredible. Really incredible. And young people are soaking it all up, right? Like they're listening to all these sounds and they're going to start to create new cross-pollinized forms of music like R&B, which leads to the youth movement and rock and roll. But that's all still in the future of our conversation. But radio also allowed the invention of the national and the international touring artist. So it's no longer simply sheet music that's traveling around the world and the songs themselves. It's back to being the composers and the performers. It's basically the 1400s all over again, the troubadour, the traveling minstrel who's taking their music out. And it's also where now it's not a one-off celebrity. It's the birth of the modern celebrity. Radio allowed us to have personalities who be- could become national and internationally renowned. It's still a few more years until the first sort of recorded music vinyl records were viewed as a means of like artistic innovation. It was really the concept album that was, that was the primary innovation around recorded music. Album was a literal term. The first albums were collections of songs or collections of 78s. If you go into a junk shop and you find old 78s, they're in these bound books called albums. And they have sleeves and the records go in there. And now you have an album. Albums were collections of songs. And that's what, that's what they became. But artists seized on the medium to innovate in the form of the concept album. There's some very famous ones. I, I would want to know if anybody knows what a concept album is or if they have any favorite ones or if they know when the first one came out. I don't know if anybody has a preconceived notion about concept albums, but feel free to yell one at me. Does anybody know when the first one came out or what it was? The wall. Big blow? Close. They're off by about 35 years. You can find it. Well, I was going to say the lamb lies down on Broadway, but it's not that then. No, it's interesting. So some people say the first concept album was in 1946, a Frank Sinatra album called The Voice of Sinatra. The Voice of Frank Sinatra. It's the first album he made as a solo artist after he left Dorsey's band. And it's a concept album in that the moods and the atmospheres, the sounds, the lyrics, the music are all, they were intentionally tied together. It was a collection of ballads from the 20s and 30s. And the music was sung and delivered in a very sincere style, no irony. Originally released as 478s and presented as a unified artistic package, tone, style, substance. But more interestingly, it was also the first pop album to be released as a 33 and a third a couple of years later when that format came out. So Columbia put that album out as the first 33 and a third. It was a 10 inch, not the 12 inches that, that Lay was digging out of her uh, storage the other day. 12 inches were only for serious music. Only classical music were 12 inches back then. Pop mm-hmm. stuff was 10 inch. We got the little stinky ones. But the first undisputably concept album was also a Sinatra record. No asterisks, no sort of revisionary history. It was called In the Wee Small Hours in 1955. That's the first concept album. And that was Frank's vision. It's basically like the hardest album you're ever going to listen to. It's all songs about depression, failed relationships, getting dumped by Ava Gardner, having your career go in the toilet. Frank wanted to make the most vulnerable record possible. The music's all tied together thematically. The album artwork fits. The lyrics fit. The arrangements fit. Even the key signatures. So the artist using technology to realize his vision. Real, real innovative stuff. And then Frank was swept away for a while by television, the teenager, (laughs) youth culture, the birth of rock and roll, all the subgenres. And then a lot of the innovation moved to the business side and business models. And a lot of the innovation moved behind the scenes for producing and presenting and delivering the music. And it's way too much to, to go into before we can open up for the more interactive part of the discussion. And, you know, we have to skip over things like hip hop, which is probably the most innovative thing to happen in popular music in the last 40 years. 
in all those areas, artistically, technologically, business-wise, financially. But, you know, I want to fast forward to the internet. And I, I wanted to play you a video because the, um, the voiceover sounds cooler coming from the source's mouth, but I'm not going to try to mess with Google here and crash the whole thing for everybody. So I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I'm going to read just a little bit more and then uh, I'll wrap up and shut up. 1999, David Bowie was being interviewed by the BBC, a guy named Jeremy Paxman. And he said, the potential of what the internet is going to do to society, both good and bad, is unimaginable. I don't think we've even seen the tip of the iceberg. I think we're actually on the cusp of something exhilarating and terrifying. And Taxman was like having none of it. None of it. And he said, uh, it's just a tool, isn't it? And David said, no, it's an alien life form. The actual context and state of content is going to be so different to anything we envisage at the moment. The interplay between the user and the provider will be so insympatico. It's going to crush our ideas of what mediums are all about. And it's happening across every form. That gray space in the middle is what the 21st century is going to be about. But the space in the middle, you know, is, it looks kind of small and almost unoccupied. You know, we talk, they're really, what, what is the middle these days? There's no middle class. There's no middle ground. There's no middle place where we all meet. But if the gray meant ambiguity, then I think he was actually more right. Or he was right about more things than I even imagined because the ability to deal with ambiguity is the thing I talk about in the business world as like the competitive trait. It's the thing that if you can possess, you will succeed in the 21st century. A comfort with ambiguity, an ability to thrive in ambiguity. To me, it's the defining characteristic in a successful person in this century. David said all those things in that interview while he was the owner of a company called Ultrastar, which I wound up running for him and which operated his internet service, which was called BowieNet. We launched BowieNet in the mid-late 90s. It was initially an ISP. So you would buy a David Bowie CD, and there'd be dial-up internet software on it. You'd pop it in your computer, and you'd be able to create your BowieNet account. And it was so much cooler than all the AOL CDs we used to get in the mail all the time back then. I, did, I know some of you are old enough to remember the inundation of AOL CDs. They should have to pay some kind of offset for all that. But it was also a social network, even though we didn't have the language for that yet. It was a distribution hub for Bowie content and commerce and things he was selling. But it was a collaborative community where David interacted with his fans, inspired them, challenged them. And he was a member of the community. His screen name was Sailor. And he'd go in the message boards, go in the conversations. He was a content contributor. He operated the store. And it was a paid subscription site in the 1990s. It was 20 bucks a month in $1999. Exclusive content, concert tickets, memorabilia, a real 21st century look at what a fan club could be. The last thing I'll tell you about that was David once ran a songwriting contest on there. And he provided the demo music. So he provided a recording, him singing the sort of la-la-las of melody, and then singing the chorus. He said, help me write this song. And there were tens of thousands of entries. We narrowed them down to, I think, 25 or 50. And David chose the winner. He flew the winner to New York, got the kid, and he was a kid. He was 20 years old. A $15,000 publishing contract with, with David's music publisher. And then put the kid in the studio, and they recorded the song. The young man and his friend who he brought along with him from Ohio sang back up on the song. And then David put the song on his album called Ours. If that all wasn't crazy enough, we webcast the whole thing, the rehearsals, the recording session. We can't find that kid now. So many of us have tried. Nobody knows where Alex Grant from Ohio went. It's too common of a name, and he doesn't seem to have made his mark in any other field. But those were the things David was doing as an artist and as an innovator and as somebody who could take technology and do things with it that we're still catching up to now. He let fans design merch, vote on which ones they should, we should make. He even had a 3D metaverse on the site in 1999. It was called Bowie World and it was an open world. You create an avatar, you could dress it up, you could walk around, you could chat with people in 1999. Now, there's all kinds of stories from Bowie Net and ultimately the Ultra Star business where we provided these platforms for innovation to other superstars. 
the Stones, the Chili Peppers, Mariah Carey, other artists who we said, here's a tool set. What would you do with it? How would you interact with your fans? And, and though it was the same platform, every one of those communities was different because the artists did different things with them and the artists' fans were different people. The most important interest thing to me was that this one man, an artist, could apply his creativity, could innovate in all these realms, music, fashion, art, technology, like even philosophy, human relations. And he did that thing in big ways and small ways over and over and over again. Even now, those of us who are working on projects for him in his absence, he left such a high bar and he told us to never create new interpretations on his behalf. So we don't define the art. We don't explain it to people. We just present it and make it available and put it on platforms where other people can interpret it and remix it and reuse it and reapply it because that was what he was most interested in. I've created this thing, but I want to see what other creative people will do with it and innovate with it. And you see things even now where people can mash up his music, can remix it, can sample it, can slice and dice it. Can I don't know if any of you have seen the new film, the documentary, and how his music and art was used there. That's what David wants people to do. And so it's all fascinating stuff. Thank you for letting me talk at you. I hope there's a conversation we could have now. We'll be back with more Spotlight On, presented by Osiris Media, after this break. And now, back to Spotlight On. Yeah, if anybody has a question, you can just pop in and ask away. Lawrence, I want to ask you, you actually are being pretty modest with your technology. You were one of the first e-commerce bookstores in Connecticut, which I was quite interested in. <laughs> and growing up around Yale, yeah, you had access to the terminals and stuff. And and also some of the stuff you guys would roll on alternate. I just, it's interesting, like, with tech, your experience, like, is it is it good just to get out there, try stuff, even before the market's even there? Some of the stuff was leading edge and dragging customers to where the world is going always seems to be a challenge for creative types, especially around technology. It's interesting. So I, I studied computer science for a few years. I didn't finish my degree, but I was always aware of technology. You know, like I said, even as a kid, I grew up sort of technology enabled and technology interested. And so I, I was in a car accident, got a small settlement and did the smartest and dumbest thing in the world, which was I opened a bookstore. This is the early nineties. I had a direct mail catalog. It was, a, it was, a, it was, a, I tell people now that's something you do at the end of your career, not at the beginning, but it was incredible. It was the equivalent of my MBA. I spent about as much money and I learned about as much, but I didn't have the vision, you know, like Bezos said, let's take a database and make every book in the world available. I said, let's take the mail order catalog and get leads to mail out the catalog. I literally had one of the first dot com websites and, you know, it all amounts to a big shrug because my idea was, well, I'll put the lead generation form online and people will request catalogs and I'll mail them out. <laughs> that was my big vision, but it worked. I started getting money orders from around the world, Israel, Japan, and I was an international business guy. It was, it was, it was great. The idea of like with tech and like even the stuff, I mean, with Bowie Net, some of that stuff's still cutting edge, but like the audience wasn't ready yet. There's a balance between being so creative or so forward leading and trying stuff. But how do you get yeah. customers to actually embrace it? And so I have this idea like sometimes it's better to be like the first second, right? There's a lot of dead pioneers on those planes. Like let somebody else go out there and kind of blaze a trail and being the first second sometimes is a more successful business model. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of people who would say if you scratch the surface of some of the the innovators and or celebrities or artistic heroes we have, you'd find that they weren't necessarily the first. They were the first popularizer, but they weren't necessarily the first. They were able to take the thing and magnify it and mainstream it or blow it up. I don't necessarily have a theory around that. I could say that does seem to be true. But in terms of what was ready and what wasn't ready, the technology definitely wasn't ready. The technology definitely wasn't ready. David had us doing things that we should not have been doing yet because they weren't good user experiences. He sold the first download through an artist website in like 1997. I don't even remember now, but it must have taken hours <laughs> to download the form. It's long. The technology wasn't ready, but it attracted the audience and it built his brand. But yeah, I don't think anybody was ready. It took the artistic mind 
to bring these things to market in novel ways. Otherwise, like real media was going to be like used for earnings calls. (laughs) (laughs) Things like that. (laughs) Hey, Leah, do you want to go ahead? So I'm really interested in fandoms and especially how they've evolved now where the artist is really not as involved. It's the fandoms that are creating on their own all of these memes and merch and experiences and i'm shocked that more artists aren't engaging with their fandoms in meaningful ways i know there's some i can't remember if it's doji cat who have actually created an advisory board of fans so she'll go to them and say hey i'm working on this song can you give me some feedback very much in the way that you were describing kind of the songwriting contest but that is the rare example. And so as you were describing BowieNet, I was like, this is so incredibly visionary. And still to this day, I don't see a lot of musical artists interacting in a way that could be incredibly productive for them. And, and the same with business. You know, their focus is on acquisition. It's not on kind of fandom. Yeah. What do you think is the barrier? And do you know of anyone that's doing anything interesting today in this space? Yeah, I, 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 I want to try to give you a concise answer. I think about this topic a lot. I've thought about it a lot over the years. Other artists have done other things. I think that there's a novelty factor because in fairness, even David, after a while, kind of drifted away from it. Very few artists want to do what everybody else has already done. It has to continue to be novel. And I, I personally, this is me, I'll, this is just me ranting, but I think as, as the business part of the industry, we failed artists in that regard. The two currents that came together were social media was a hoodwink on the artists, right? Drive your fans to these other platforms because there's, will help you reach more people there. And then guess what? Now we're going to charge you to reach them. That was so alluring to artists. Oh, I don't have to be dedicated to this website that I'd have to feed day in, day out. I don't need another job. Like, I just want to go on vacation. So the social media networks were were alluring, but they were they hoodwinked the artists, in my opinion. And the, and the competing strand was, I think, we didn't continue to bring them wholly owned platforms, the ability to do the next version of Bonanet. So are there other artists doing things? I mean, I look at a band like BTS. Yeah, they're very distant maybe from their fans, but they go right up to the glass. You know, I, I, I watched some of their webcasts. Like I understood it instantly, right? Like it resonated with me. I was like, this is fun. If I, if I were in this demographic, I would think this is the coolest thing ever, but you're still not really interacting with them. One thing that I've found that I love to do is I kind of rediscovered my joy of being in a fandom. And being a fan, and I recently became a Pyam, which is this three sister band. And so I, I just kind of interact with the fandom on Twitter, who are basically all teenage girls. I don't know if they realize that I'm like a Gen X or whatever, but it's really fascinating because they have their own language and their own like mythologies around each member of the band and different kind of story. And it's just it's really fascinating to see an artist through the lens of the fan versus how the the artist kind of presents itself themselves because it's not as interesting to be honest as the way the fans yes. think about it. at this point i feel yeah, like from a marketing and branding perspective it's completely flopped or flipped the last thing i would say on that point before i, I shut up for other people is that i do use the one-liner a lot that fan is short for fanatic and i think a lot of artists learn that the hard way there's a lot of sense of ownership and Fans bring a lot of emotional connection to those relationships. And you have to think about that intensity when you're on the receiving end of that. Even if it's mediated by a screen and a phone line, like it's, it's pretty heavy. People think they know you and now you're connected in some way. They're leaving you messages. They're asking you for help. They're threatening to kill themselves. They're telling you when their mom died, when their dog died, when they're having a great day. It's a lot. And so I think. A lot of artists are potentially rightly afraid to open that spigot because it's hard to turn it back off because now you've abandoned the community. Right, right, right. That's a great point. So, so do you want to go ahead? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was just listening to what you were saying there. I had breakfast uh, when Mark Thompson was still the chief executive at the New York Times. And I have a very, very small TV show. And he said, have you become famous? And I said, well, 
I tend to wear a shirt with a collar when I travel on aeroplanes. And he said, why? And he said, well, because somebody always asks you for a selfie. And he said, do you get what Chelsea said? And to be honest, no, I never ever see anybody other time. Said, and look, I've made a lot of people very famous. And he said, every one of them would say they want to go back to that as the optimal level of fame, which is you get asked occasionally for a selfie in an airport. And that is the, because after that, it does become overwhelming. But the, the reason I put my hand up was, you know, you said the thing about attention. I mean, no, this is how I think it is. Attention's become, and in this attention economy, it's become disconnected from a sort of human editorial process. An algorithm doesn't care whether you, it's getting your attention because this is something good or fun or interesting or anything like that. It just wants your attention. So it just gets you back on and it can be hate scrolling, all sorts of things. David Bowen, when he was talking about the sort of future that almost seemed the potential of a dystopian future, I don't know, maybe he foresaw that when you get a just an AI that's working out what goes out of so the 20,000 posts, what goes into the top end of your feed, it's not thinking like an editor is and saying, you know, it's not thinking, there's no creative person in there. It's just what will make you watch for the next 20 seconds, next 20 minutes. We had, we had to call one, a, a member one time. His screen name was and he, I forget what it, even what it was now. He was raising hell on the message boards. At one point, David said to him, don't go away angry, just go away. <laughs> but even now, like, man, to have the rock gods just frown upon you that way, it must have been the worst thing. But we, 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 call, we were going to call them. We were going to be like, dude, like, well, who are you? And like, why are you doing this? Why do you pay money to come here to do this? And we called him and his mom answered the phone. The whole time we were thinking we were calling a normal adult. And we weren't. We were calling a grown person who was obsessed with the internet and obsessed with attention and probably lived in the, I, I don't even know what the profile was, but it wasn't happy. Not, you know, in fact, the young man who won the songwriting contest, you can Google some of the, there's a bunch of stuff on YouTube because it was used to be called CD net. Jeff Davis had a little like internet TV channel and they covered this whole thing. And they interviewed the kid who won the songwriting contest. The song is about the good and bad of the internet. That's probably why David chose the lyrics. And they interviewed the kid and he said, this is 1999. He said, I got on the internet three years ago. I didn't know anything about it. And it basically devoured my whole life. Like I was on the internet constantly and I realized it wasn't a good thing for me. Mm. And that's what this song is about. And that was 1999. Mm. Wow. I wrote it down actually. I thought it was beautiful. The ability to deal with ambiguity and thrive in it to be a defining characteristic of the world we're, we're in. And I would argue, such as I know about the guy, that he... He, he lived that ambiguity brilliantly. I mean, I remember when I was a young kid, my mum, as you can imagine, who's 84, throwing her head in the air the first time he was on top of the pot saying, what on earth is this? You know, is it a man? Is it a woman? And as someone who kind of grew up really into music at the back end of the 70s, early 80s, for me in London, it was probably, I wasn't into that scene, but it was probably the Blitz Club and all that new romantics. To them... Boy George, all the Spandau Ballet guys. You know, Bowie was the hero that allowed them to be whatever they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, it just seems to me to be an enormous legacy to leave, to, to actually allow future generations probably forever to be whatever they want to be with a degree of comfort. I know there were others, but he was the king, right? If there was a theme on Bowie Net, it was that. You could go on the message board. You can go to davidbowie.com now and all the same people are still in there. It's just not Bowie net anymore. And that is the governing theme is that David made the world safe for them and made it possible for them to be who and what they are. And that's everybody from disabled people, queer people, different thinking people, different looking people. Like it didn't matter the specifics of the situation. Any kind of perceived difference or perceived otherness he definitely gave those people at the very least comfort, if not like outright permission and emboldenedness. For sure. You're you're a hundred percent right on that. Well, that was great. Lawrence, thank you so much, Lawrence Perrier, for spending time with us. That was great. I, Lawrence has a great podcast called Spotlight On. I think you're well over a hundred episodes now with interesting yeah. people from music, entertainment, the business side of it, and really been at the forefront of creativity and technology. And I really yeah, what you said about Using technology to advance creativity, 
I thought was really positive. Can I, can we Thanks. share your uh, email address with the group here? They want to reach yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, per- it's, it got, uh, it's, it's L P E R Y E R L Perrier at gmail.com. Perfect. Or if you want to go old school, I might still have L Perrier at David Bowie. You could try it, <laughs> try it. And I'll send, and I'll tell you if it works or not. I may have maintained that address. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark Ross and the members of Brigadoon. And as always, thank you for listening to Spotlight On, which is presented by Osiris Media and brought to you by Light. Executive producers are Lawrence Purrier, Ant Taylor, Brian Brinkman, RJB, and Matt Dwyer. Spotlight On is produced by Craig Snyder, with post-production by Michael Donaldson, and theme music by Q Burns Abstract Message. If you like what you've heard, please share us with a friend and leave a review on your podcast platform of choice. Visit us online at spotlightonpodcast.com or at spotlightonpod on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Be safe and stay in touch. service.